security matter in a burning cabbie where two British and Italian national lost their lives. And Mr. Oha Ahibe joins us now. He's a security consultant. Thank you for coming on this morning. Thank you very much. Well, we have been looking at uh, ways to, well, consistently see how we could bring this to an end. And you have talked about the fact that, yeah, we will have more of these kind of matters. Uh, now we've got this in our hands. But we must keep looking forward. What steps perhaps would you suggest we take next to see how we can perhaps avoid this kind of scenario? Well, when you say avoid, that's a big word because, um, I mean, this is an interesting development, you know, this the rescue attempt. Um, it's a very complex type of operation, and I can say that um, with benefit of hindsight because I've been involved in similar operations in the past. It's a tough call on all sides. It's a tough call. Um, from two presidents. Uh, it's a tough call for team commanders because you have a situation on the ground that's constantly changing. No matter the amount of intelligence that you have before you move on site, that continues to change. There are tough calls. Do you call off the operation, you know, midway? Um, so it's, it's interesting that, you know, we're able to carry out this type of an operation. For me, I think it's a step in, in, in the right direction because what we see here is sharing of intelligence between the British and Nigerian uh, special forces. We see that we're able to extend capabilities to show that we're ready to strike where we need to strike. Um, in, in these kind of operations, you would normally do the math. You know, you want a 90 to 95 percent chance of success. You have one or two seconds that will determine failure or success because you have a situation where hostages are guarded and they have a guard that says, um, that's told rather, if anybody tries to rescue these people, shoot them. So you have just one or two seconds to get there. Even when you get them, there's the extraction procedure where you have to take these people off site. Now we don't have all the details of this operation and probably yeah. We won't have all the details because these kind of operations are very classified, as you'd understand. But I mean, the scenario itself mm -hmm. is something that we can we can analyze. It's always going to be a very difficult one because it's been they've been there for a while now since last year, and it's also possible, just as you say, that um, you can't have all the information. It keeps changing by the second. That means it's possible that perhaps. The might have been information or passed down to uh, his captor saying, well, if certain things happen or if you see these kind of uh, indicators, do A, B, C, or D. And it's possible that the security agencies may not be privy to that information, so it makes it a lot more tougher. It's a very, very complex operation, and that's why I said it's a tough call. Um, even the members of the team, it's something that you don't want to do because you're handpicked to, to carry out these kind of operations. And it, it can go wrong, it can go right. If it goes right, yeah, fine. But I think, you know, the, um, on both sides, they've, done, they've carried out a large assessment. These guys have been there since May. Uh -huh. So the questions are, um, would, the, would the terrorists shoot them anyway? How much time do we have? Because the idea of holding the hostages is to have leverage. So the thing, the thing is, you have to make a call. Hmm. And the decision to make that call must have been based on the fact that um, a conclusion had been reached that this is the best option to take at this point in time. Mm. And, yeah, sorry, you're going to say. Yeah, so the terrorists weren't. Is this a new angle we're saying to it? Because it would seem that before now, we've not heard a lot about kidnappings. This is, is about, uh, you know, um, you know, killing the people on the spot, as it were, causing terror. But in this particular instance, we see the kidnapping of foreigners, not even of, say, highly placed Nigerians or, you know, just any Nigerian, but foreigners. Do you think that was strategic as well? Of course. Um, I mean, we saw this play, playing out several times, even up to now in the Niger Delta. I mean, the idea most of the time is to get leverage, uh, is to up the stakes in your negotiating power, and this is what they will do. They will continue to just deploy themselves through different tactics. Um, but I think I'm kind of quite happy that we've been able to stand up and actually make this decision to go out and strike. It's unfortunate the way it ended up, but then um, it's, a, it's something that you just anticipate. There's that 5% chance of failure, and unfortunately that's what happened in this, this incident. Okay, this incident is, is a burning cabbie. Now, sometime this year, there was another one in Kano, 
and um, one wonders are we have you, you've almost like said but are we, is it like a recurrent is it a recurrent decimal um, f for instance um, someone sent in a tweet here um, Sarah Law says during the period of Abata we had a group OPC um, the passenger administration had to deal with men then now the Jonathan administration is having to deal with Boko Haram is it like for every administration that comes in one group stands out to begin to want to voice itself um, well I think you know if we kind of go back down memory lane like you tried to do from that tweet, you, you'd find out that this has been going on. The definition of terrorism is something that we've sort of just come to. But then terrorism has a wider definition. You can term it political violence. And that's something we've seen for a long time, you know, uh, manifesting in, in communal clashes, um, religious clashes. So by the books, sometimes this is part of national development. It's it's <laughs> it's difficult to be able to accept that, and I'm not saying that we should accept it as something that we must go through. But um, we're trying to become a nation, and there are tough choices that we must make. You know, I keep saying <coughs> that this threat can actually bring us together because it puts issues on the table. You know, and we make those decisions and say, listen. We are Nigerians, and we're going to fight against all of this. So here's the good part. We have two foreigners um, held hostage in some unknown location, and we went after them to try and rescue them. Now, what this message is, is people can expect help, rather than, you know, you're just there, held hostage, help is not coming. You don't know if it's going to come. So the thing now is that we can start to expect our government to move on behalf of anybody that's taken hostage, even though in saying that every, it, every hostage situation would be treated on a case-by-case -case basis. There's, there are no assumptions that everybody that's held hostage in 24 hours want to spring that person. It's, you just don't do it that way. Well, in terms of the kind of response with uh, this particular case in point now, it keeps popping up uh, ethnic issues, uh, issues you say keep popping up, and you have a lot of people saying, we don't seem to be addressing those ethnic issues. It looks as though they say we seem to be glossing over it and thinking it can't be that. There's a larger picture to it. How do you see that? Well, I think that people are discussing a whole lot of these issues. Um, social media, there's a whole lot of discourse there. Um, but they want it to, be, to it go beyond that, isn't it? Yeah, but then people have to talk about these things. I mean, if you go on social media these days, you, you find that people have set up lots of groups, you know. Uh, there's an interesting group I've seen online that's called the Coalition Against Terrorism. Oh. And people are talking, this is a Nigerian group, people are talking about issues. I talked about Citizens United initiative that we've set up, you know, to kind of talk about the issues. And I've seen people from different backgrounds, um, people talking about the religious issues, the ethnic issues, their extreme views. But then you see, this is how it, what kind of creates terrorism, when people cannot express themselves. People should be allowed to express themselves within, you know, the law. People need to understand what the law is because sometimes I think some people are not fully aware of what provisions the law gives them to express themselves in a democracy. But when the, when the expression itself questions the very room or the very law that gives them room for expression, what happens in that particular instance? I'll just give this to you point blank. Justice has to be served in many cases. Like in these cases that we're dealing with, people have to be made to realize that if you go out and murder anyone, you'll be held accountable. Now, we're in a process where, you know, the government is considering negotiating with the Boko Haram, for instance. In my opinion, we have to be very careful about that so we don't set a wrong precedence because um, we don't know what other groups are going to jump up tomorrow. And political violence is a means that people have, over the years, de just developed to be able to achieve their objectives. You know, so people have to be, they have to be aware of the fact that the law exists and justice will be served whenever, however long it takes. I mean, we look at the classical case of Osama and it took, what, 10 years? So we also have to get to that understanding that whatever amnesty program will be coming up, if you've murdered someone, you will be held accountable. Now, interestingly, terrorism, it has become an international crime. So we can deal with this on an international level as well. There are, there are provisions in international law for 
the use of force, but that is to defend yourself. So if you aggressively attack a nation, citizens of a nation, then you should be held accountable. What do you think this does for trust? In us. Do you think that even though, yes, uh, Prime Minister David Cameron thanked uh, the Nigerian government for its cooperation, do you think that, you know, this is going to affect future relations and the, uh, the warnings that most likely their citizens might get living in Nigeria? I don't really think so because you've got experts working in crisis areas around the world. People are still going to Iraq to work. We've got crisis in Mexico. People have been abducted in Mexico over the last 10 years, and people are still going into the sector to work. Yes, the risk is higher. That means that um, experts would need higher insurance. That means they probably need more protection. But people will get better paid. <laughs> That's the other side of it. But then you will see people coming into work because people just have to work. They're not going to stop working because um, we've got threats. But is this, is this a, do, you, do you think this is a change of tactic by Boko Haram? Because, I mean, this is like the first case of kidnapping that is being reported. And what exactly do you think the aim is? You've already mentioned leverage. But what kind of leverage do you think they were looking at getting here? Is it money? Is it just a bargaining chip? Um, what exactly it could do you be, think you're trying to achieve? It could be a few things. It could be money. I don't know at this point. But then the thing is that the tactics will continue to change. I mean, when you look at the nature of terrorism, there are certain things that you can identify. Hostage taking is one of those things. Bombing is something else that they do. So they will continue to explore different avenues, you know, of just creating that fear factor and trying to give the impression that they can be anywhere. But I think that if I review the situation in the last six weeks, in a way, they're still a little constrained to certain areas. Um, that doesn't mean that we have to fall asleep. You know, we, we, we've not had incidents probably in, in the south, in the southwest. But these are targets as well because they will always want to extend our forces. Now, we're also dealing with a few issues in the Niger Delta still. And uh, these are challenges that we just have to continue to meet. You know, we can't deploy all our resources to the northeast to deal with Boko Haram, and then we leave the rear exposed. Yeah, okay. Speaking um, of which, sorry, uh, do you think we sufficiently dealt with um, men? Mm. I, I think, to respond to that, I think that we could have had a more comprehensive um, solution to the problem in the Niger Delta. We, when you talk about men, let's just assume that's a, an umbrella yeah. for all of the militant groups in Niger Delta. I think that there is a lingering problem, you know, in the sense that um, we have some people that were not militants and some people that were felt marginalized and deprived as well, but did not take up arms. And some of those people haven't benefited from the amnesty program. So where do they fall? The, th the question is, are they going to be blaming themselves now for not joining um, the militant groups then? So I think the, the, the fact is that the government has to move quickly to be able to address you know these questions provides that infrastructure for people you know to be able to get the jobs to get the trainings because it does appear sometimes as if um, some of the people on the that benefited from the amnesty program have become a certain class of individuals you know so we have to be very very aware of that yeah. all right um, when you were talking earlier you meant you were talked about negotiations with um, the terrorists and you said we need to be careful. Government needs to be careful. But also talking to said you meant you said something that sounded like those identified need to be punished. Question do we have the infrastructure to handle first of all proper negotiation if we are indeed going to negotiation? And then do we have the infrastructure to punish those identified? I think that's a fantastic question because the two issues here we're talking of legislative issues legal issues, probably even political issues. Um, in terms of the law, I think the, we, within the existing f legal framework, yes, we can punish people. Uh, murder is murder. Arson is arson. Um, now, how we can deal with all of this is just going to depend on the amount of political will that we have. Because sometimes, you know, we're running away from some of the issues. You know, people have been arrested in the past. We need to see the whole legal process being followed. 
there are legislations that need to be reviewed that can actually determine who acts where and when. Like we have a situation now where we've had special forces go out to try and rescue hostages. So whose role is this? Is this a military role? And then when we have the conspiracy phase where people sit down and then they plan to go out, who has that role? Is that the SSS role or the police role? Because sometimes, you know, we see a little confusion within the agencies. And I think that the way to address this will be with policies, but also with legislation. So we need to look at some of the um, existing legislations. Now, case in point, um, if we go back to 9-11, when 9-11 happened, basically ha ha dealing with terrorism was an FBI role. But after 9-11, yeah. they went back, looked at the framework, and they established the homeland security, which comprised of immigration. Now, in Nigeria, if you look at the, um, the immigration duties, part of their duty is border security. So the question is, what does that mean? How do they defend the borders? Is it just at the borders or within the borders as well? So we might be looking at an increased or enhanced responsibility. We look at the prison service as well. They've become a target. Um, so we need to look at the legislations again, the, the responsibilities of the prison service. The whole ministry, ministry of Interior, um, we have to look at what their roles are as defined you know, under existing legislations and maybe revisit that as well, just to ensure that our agencies become more effective. You know, some time ago, when the president said that uh, they had infiltrated perhaps Asura, mm. there were those who thought, okay, maybe sooner rather than later, we're going to hear something, maybe someone up there had been indicted or someone's going to face the law. Nobody's heard any such thing. Does that mean anything or does it suggest anything? Well, terrorism overlaps with um, politics. It relates to political violence. So, so I, I say that because there are those who suggest that it's also possible that someone must have leaked information about the strike or the operation to some other person, so you never know. Hypothetically. You, 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 that you can't rule that out. I just want to, I don't want to imagine that that happened, oh. but it can't be ruled out. But, um, and the reason I don't want to imagine that happening is that people's lives are at risk, yeah. you know? I've been in that kind of operation before, and I know how dangerous it is. You can go on site and nobody comes back alive. So. This is the thing. We need to look at our whistleblowing policies, for instance. If, if we can actually trace people that compromise, like he was saying, how do we, do we have the moral courage to deal with them? Now, if we discover that there are people in the government, by omission or commission, pass on information that compromises security, we have to go through the whole legal process because sometimes we have to be careful that we don't develop a witch hunt. Because that's sometimes what it's reduced to, you know. You just label somebody, and then before we know what's happening, he's in jail. We have to ensure we have all of the evidence that can stand up in court. So it's very delicate, then. It's very delicate. We have to have that evidence that will stand up to the scrutiny of the courts, because it's going to be dealt with through the legal process. Have we done enough, even in terms of the law? Because when you talk about the Homeland Security, they also came up with the U.S. Patriot Act. But here we have lawyers who say, well, yes, yeah, so we've got our laws here. There's sufficient just the uh, operation of it. What do you think? Well, even the U.S. Patriot Act, I mean, there are lots of people that feel that... Uh, it's always it amended anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's the latest amendment to it. Well, that's the thing, because, you know, you're looking at privacy. Uh, and the question is, how far are you willing to let the government go to defend you? You know, are you willing to just forgo your privacy? So um, it, it's, like we were saying, based on trust. What we expect is that we can develop trust for the agencies. We still have a lot of work to do on that, for the citizens to work with the agencies, to work closer with them. And it's always going to be difficult for them to trust the agencies, even peacetime, call it peacetime. They can't depend on them, you know. If there's extortion going on, it's just going to be difficult. Do you yeah, think I was we'll going to, yeah. to ask you, how would that work when oh. the agencies... Maybe not all of them, but you find out that some of these agencies tend to abuse the trust that the people have placed in them. I mean, case in point, a man is arrested for one thing, he dies in custody, no reason. And not that it might be that health problems, it might be, I didn't say so, but the attitude of the agency in response to the complaint, mm -hmm. do you think that will work? Well... I can talk from ben benefit of hindsight again, but um, 
working in military intelligence, we've, we've had people that have come off the streets as what you call walking informants, people who just um, feel they have a duty to pass on information at their own risk. Now, um, the way they're treated, they're treated as people that need to be protected. And there, there's a system in place to ensure that um, it's, it's on a need-to-know basis that the information is passed on. It's, it's not for everybody's consumption. So I can only talk within some of the agencies that I've worked within. Um, we do have people that make money out of information, that's a fact. But then you have the internal system within every agency that vets each of its staff. Because once there's, once there's disclosure on classified information, you know, you see it in the press. So the question is, how did this get out there? Or um, maybe a mission. Like the incident we have now is compromised. There's definitely going to be a post-operation analysis on this operation because they're going to be asked. They're going to review the operation again to say what went wrong. They might come to a conclusion that well, it does seem as if these people had information that we were coming. So how do you trace the leak, or was it just something circumstantial? Oh. You know, you had a guard who, for some reason, <coughs> left his duty post. Um, and then was somewhere else, maybe having a smoke, and then he stumbled on one of the raiding team. It happens. Okay. You know, it's, that's how dangerous these operations are. What about that part where uh, people can walk in, volunteer information, talking about society now? Because it looks as though that's an important piece in this whole uh, fight against terrorism. Mm. Have we gotten to that point where people, no matter how risky their lives may be at the time, who walk into any of the security agencies and volunteer information? Well, I think that we are at that point where people do have to do that. Um, they'll be putting themselves in harm's way sometimes. But then the question is, if you, if you don't do anything, what do you expect to happen? You could be the next victim. But in saying this, it's, it's, at the end of the day, it's just going to be an individual having to make a call on that. Now, okay, I get certain information, and you're my pal, Trambley, and I tell you, we have a chit chat about it, and I say, "What do you think I should do?" If you talk to somebody, you know, talk to somebody responsible, and say, "You might not disclose the information you have, but say I have information. It's very important. What do you think I should do?" Get some advice. You know, at the end of the day, it's just going to be that individual having to make that call. Mm. It's a tough call. Uh, you know, you're talking about trust earlier. I was just about to ask you. Are we making progress? I mean, the SSS has been helping to raise an awareness as this is a threat that is confronting us all and we need to tackle it headlong together. Do you think we're making progress in that regard? Has, has there been any reports, as it were, of citizens coming forward and helping protect you know, the societies against terrorists? Well, the fact is, if people are coming forward to pass on the information, you wouldn't know. No, that definitely. People are always um, coming forward to pass on information. The question is, how credible is the information sometimes? So you're having to sieve through all kinds of information, perceived, wrong, right. You're, you're having, there's, there's a way you grade information, and it kind of determines what you act on and what you leave for later. Sometimes, unfortunately, because you don't have all the resources in the world, you act on the wrong information when you, know, you should have taken other th information as priority. We saw that in the 77 bombing in London where they actually had information on some of the bombers. But then they thought, well, these guys are not going to act now, so let's concentrate on other people. And then the result of that was a devastation in, in, in the UK. So um, I don't know. There, there are no easy answers to all of these questions, you know. But I do think that we are making um, progress. This um, strike just shows that we're ready to deploy. We're ready to actually take the risk. I mean, it's a tough call. But then again, I don't know. Um, if, if we have all the details, it would be easier to do an analysis because sometimes, you know, you have terrorists in an enclave. They actually have an area that they control. So it makes it so much more difficult for you to get in there because Everybody knows everybody. Uh, sometimes they have hostages that they move around. You know, they don't stay in one place. So, but I think that we're, we're definitely making progress. Should there be any such thing as maybe special community efforts in terms of uh, putting in place their own systems and strategy in a bit to raise their own security awareness? Yes, we, we can adopt um, community policing measures. Um, I mean, we've seen that in, in, in the U.S. model, in the U.K. as well, where you have volunteers. However, we need to work out 
frameworks for that. Um, how that's going to function, you know, because we have to be aware of the fact that if you allow people to have that kind of authority, that can be right. abused as well. So you should be careful of the kind of people that occupy those positions. Yeah, definitely, definitely. But it's a, it's a means that can work. It definitely can work, but we just have to explore it and just look at all it from all the angles.